This is a story about a guitar as a weapon. It's August 25th, 1968, and a couple thousand people are gathered in Lincoln Park in Chicago. It's the first day of what was supposed to be a festival called the Festival of Life. It was supposed to be a big free rock concert that was going to have everybody from the Rolling Stones to the Grateful Dead. But only one band actually showed up. They were a little band from Detroit who hadn't even recorded their debut album yet. They already had a reputation as one of the best live bands in the country. And after this performance, their legendary status would be sealed. They were called the MC5. When you get the feeling you got the sock along with a mic in my hand. Then they kick out the jam. The MC5 was a band started a few years before by two teenage friends, Wayne Kramer and Fred Sonic Smith. They brought in this guy named Rob Tyner to be their manager, and then their bass player, and then eventually their lead singer, plus a bassist, Michael Davis, and a drummer named Dennis Thompson. It was Rob Tyner that decided to name them the Motor City Five, or MC5 for short. The band members all shared a love of loud, fast garage rock, and also experimental free jazz. Wayne Kramer and Fred Smith would often try to make their guitars sound like John Coltrane's saxophones. But the band was also united by a love of leftist politics. Their manager was this guy named John Sinclair, who along with a couple others started a White Panther movement to parallel the Black Panthers. It was meant as an anti-racist revolutionary group, and the MC5 represented them in musical form. In 1967, the band released their first single on a small label. It was a cover of the band Them, Van Morrison's garage rock band. It was a song called I Can Only Give You Everything. Then in 1968, they had another single on a small label, this time with their own original song. The singles did well locally. The small pressings that they made sold out, but where the band really started to build its reputation was as a live band. The MC5 were louder and faster and more aggressive than pretty much any band out there. They got a chance to go on tour opening for some bigger bands like Janis Joplin's Big Brother and the Holding Company and Eric Clapton's Cream. And at every show, the MC5 ended up blowing the headliners off the stage. Of course, eventually the record labels came calling. This guy named Danny Fields from Electra Records came to see the band in Detroit and immediately wanted to sign them. He'd never seen anything like it before. So he even asked Wayne Kramer, are there any other bands in Detroit that are like you? And Wayne Kramer said, well, nobody is like us, but you know who you should really see is our friends, the Stooges. So based on Kramer's recommendation, Danny Fields also went to see Iggy Pop and the Stooges and ended up signing them to Elektra too. But around the same time in August of 1968, the MC5 also got invited to the Festival of Life. The Festival of Life was being put on by this group called the Yippies. The Yippies were led by these two guys, Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, who were hippies and activists and were especially against the Vietnam War. They called their proposed festival the Festival of Life because they said that the current Democratic Party led by Lyndon Johnson had become the party of death. And the Democratic National Convention that year was happening in Chicago. Now, it was an especially turbulent time in American history. Lyndon Johnson, the current president who had taken over after John F. Kennedy was assassinated, he had decided not to run for re-election. His vice president, Hubert Humphrey, became the presumptive nominee. So the Democratic Party was divided by those that wanted to support Vice President Humphrey and those that wanted a different candidate, like the anti-war senator from Minnesota, Eugene McCarthy. The country was also in a really dark place because Martin Luther King had been assassinated in April, and then somebody who people thought would have been the Democratic nominee for president, Robert F. Kennedy, was assassinated in June. And so a bunch of different groups opposed to the war in Vietnam decided to come to Chicago to protest the Democratic National Convention. And this made the mayor of Chicago, Richard Daley, very nervous. He refused to grant almost all permits, including for people who wanted to protest peacefully. He definitely was not going to give a permit to Abby Hoffman to have a giant music festival in Lincoln Park. This is why none of the other bands showed up except for the MC5. You're asking for a parks permit for public yeah, and rock music. No, of course not. But the protesters decided to come anyway. A few days before the convention was supposed to start, on August 23rd, things started out on a pretty light note. The Yippies held their own nomination ceremony for their own candidate for president, a pig, that they named Pigasus. Then came August 25th, and the MC5 showed up in Lincoln Park with their guitars and drums ready to play. They thought they were going to be playing on the back of a flatbed truck that would double as a stage, but since they didn't have any permits, the police wouldn't let the truck come in. Wayne Kramer, who was 20 years old at the time, said that there was no stage, there were no trucks, there were no toilets, there was no electricity, 
Wayne Kramer ate some hash brownies, the band borrowed some electricity from a local hot dog vendor, and then the band proceeded to rock the faces off the couple thousand people there like only the MC5 could. Later, Wayne Kramer would say, standing there in Lincoln Park, defiantly, guitar as weapon in hand, I had faith that our action was going to hold power. Unfortunately, that day is also when most of the violence started. After the MC5 set, the Chicago police came through, beating up the people who had just been watching them play. The next day, August 26th, is when the convention actually started, and there were more protesters that were met with tear gas and beatings from police. Even with news cameras rolling and the crowd chanting, the whole world is watching. <laughs> Hubert Humphrey was confirmed at that Democratic National Convention. He did become the candidate, but he lost in November to Richard Nixon. And when Nixon took office in 1969, his attorney general rounded up a bunch of the organizers of the protests in Chicago to prosecute them, including members of the MOB, SDS, the Black Panther, Bobby Seale, and the Yippies, Abby Hoffman, and Jerry Rubin. They were known as the Chicago Eight, although Bobby Seale was later tried separately, so they were known as the Chicago Seven. And they did get convicted, although later it was overturned on appeal. The MC5 themselves weren't charged with anything, but later their manager, John Sinclair, was arrested for marijuana possession and maybe trying to firebomb a CIA building in Ann Arbor. Back home in Detroit on October 30th and 31st, the MC5 started recording their debut album. They decided that instead of taking the conventional route and going to a studio, they would record it live. They recorded it in Detroit at a place called the Grand Ballroom, and those recordings, with some overdubs done later, were released as the band's debut album, Kick Out the Jams, in 1969. The record did pretty well. It went to number 30 on the charts, and the title track, Kick Out the Jams, became the MC5's defining song. Although it's also the song that got their record banned in a lot of places, because this is how singer Rob Tyner chose to intro the song. Right now, right now it's time to... Take out the jams, motherfucker! The band ended up putting out two more albums, but broke up in 1972. But before he passed earlier this year, guitarist Wayne Kramer actually started working on a new MC5 album. That album is going to come out this October and features a bunch of legendary guest musicians like Slash and Tom Morello and Vernon Reed from Living Color. And this year, the MC5 are finally going to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, something that they definitely deserve. Even though the band was short-lived, they were one of the most important rock bands ever. Let me kick out the chain. Yeah, kick out the chain.